the Asia panel. We are discussing the greening of blockchain. My name is Mark Müller-Eberstein. I'm welcoming you to from Seattle. Welcoming the world here. Um, myself, I've been 30 years in the IT industry with Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, running the EdgeTech Corporation for the last 10 years. Um, I've been written a couple of books, and most of my time I spent investing into technology companies for the last decade. With me today, we have a very illustrious panel. We're going around in a few minutes to making sure that everybody has a chance to introduce themselves appropriately because I couldn't do it as well uh, and couldn't do it justice, I'm sure. But I can promise you, this is probably one of the highlight discussions you're going to see at this event. We're not only talking about technology, we're talking about the impact on, uh, on the society as well as on the environment, um, environmental and uh, as long as uh, uh, on the environmental impact of blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies, and what does this mean for the economic systems. Since I've been with Horasis for the far, last four years, blockchain has come such a, far, uh, such a long way, from when we needed to explain what it is to now professional investors, family offices, really embracing the opportunity with Bitcoin, but also corporation having hundreds of thousands of, uh, of implementations now where blockchain technology is used in the enterprise environment. Please join me and welcome our guests today. And I would like to start with the lady here, with Martha, and giving us a quick update uh, on who you are, what you're doing. And don't talk too much about Filecoin, but I want to know more, please. Okay, I'll be super quick. I'm Marta Belcher. I'm an attorney at Ropes and Gray, uh, and I focus on blockchain and emerging technologies. Uh, I'm also the outside general counsel of Protocol Labs. We just launched a very exciting project called Filecoin that was several years in the making. Uh, and I also am special counsel at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I do work on blockchain and civil liberties issues. Thank you, Marta. Vaniki, you want to get, get us a quick introduction, please? Sure. Uh, hi all, uh, I'm Vamiki Mukherjee, uh, here representing the Cyber Future Foundation. It's my non-profit that we founded a few years back. Uh, I can't believe it's already fifth year. And, uh, you know, this uh, this has been a platform for most of the executive leaders in cybersecurity come together to discuss different challenges and issues uh, on global, uh, uh, you know, global challenges. Uh, my day job is with Ernst & Young. I run the cybersecurity uh, program for critical infrastructure energy security. Um, so, you know, a crossroads of cyber and uh, now with ecosystem economics, it's uh, very fascinating to talk about environmental sustainability as well. So glad to be here. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Vamiki. And I think the security portion is such an important uh, contribution that crypto, tech, uh, crypto can bring um, to how we think about data and connectivity in the future as well. Mario, why don't you go next? Thank you, Mark. Uh, hi, I'm Mario Alberto Casiraghi. I'm Chief of Strategy and Chief Financial Officer at Exfinite. Uh, we're launching a um, blockchain-based entertainment solution for Southeast Asia. My background is in finance, investment banking, where I um, happily moved out of uh, in 2016 to join the blockchain movement and technology. And I take care about uh, blockchain architecture, token economics, and um, kind of bringing mass adoption to the blockchain space on the, in the entertainment space. Super. Thank you, Mario. And I think we all need more entertainment these days, for sure. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alex, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex, head of finance at C-Labs, working on Cello, which is a open blockchain platform uh, it giving financial tools to anyone with a mobile phone. Well, financial management, I think, at least for those that have, a, that have the opportunity to manage their finances or for those that are, for, uh, that are definitely want to make sure we'll do it better. <laughs> um, last but not least, Sandeep, give us a quick update on yourself and then I have start with the first question just for you. Okay. So, uh, again, I'm Sandeep based in Los Angeles. And my company, Toroid, we're working on a lightweight uh, blockchain fabric for high-density IoT applications for healthcare, public safety, and manufacturing. So, uh, again, IoT sensors generate lots and lots of data. And, uh, again, order the management more than what you would see with Bit, uh, Bitcoin. And also data has, a, again, a different value within the enterprise and externally 
So the, the crypto protocols don't apply in straightforward ways. And uh, the focus, again, for us is to bridge the private IoT blockchains with the public ledgers to actually impact uh, the OPEX, privacy, cybersecurity, interoperability, but reduce the transactional overhead significantly. And I worked with Census for over 30 years in about you know eight or 10 verticals. And so now bringing the attractiveness of the distributed ledger, which we've seen for cryptocurrencies as a data bus for sensors, and mm-hmm. you know, trying to do it in a more sustainable way. Sandeep, with your technical background, I would just like to start uh, drilling a little bit more into the details. Um, when I presented to the ASEAN conf- a, a global conference in 2016, you found com- country representatives from Singapore that understood very well what blockchain can do, the Chinese as well, while other countries were just in the very, very beginning. One of the things, though, that came out over the last four years more and more is what's the environmental impact of Bitcoin mining? There is this, all this talking about um, energy consumption. Potentially, is Bitcoin using as much energy as a whole country? Um, but I think when we start to have these discussions, I need to have a basic understanding of technology, blockchain technology, and something that's called consensus. Can you help us and our group here to understand a little bit more about it, please? This is here, and I think the best way to understand consensus in simple terms is to actually, you know, just take a uh, snapshot of what this Bitcoin network actually consumes, right? So here are just a couple of facts for those of you who may not know. We are today, Bitcoin processing is using 50% of equivalent global data data center demand. You know, so we think that cloud is running everything, but but just in perspective, 50% of our data centers are, you know, being used essentially for crypto mining and transacting. Another one is, as you mentioned yourself, that, you know, today, Bitcoin is using more energy than many countries, surpassed Denmark a long time ago, and it's now Chile and 50 other countries, Israel, and you name it. Okay, so that, that's what drives. And also from a sustainability standpoint, you know, you cannot consume this much energy and not do serious damage. So, for example, the actual CO2 footprint of Bitcoin is more than New Zealand. So, so it, it's a, and, and what, what it really comes down to is at the you know end of the day all about the consensus protocol okay so just so you know so it's energy is the actual driver of everything and uh, now to level set the consensus algorithm this is, is basically the protocol through which parties in a blockchain come to an agreement uh, mm-hmm. and, and what the data state of the ledger is and how it is updated it is mm-hmm. the basis of trust mm-hmm. the algorithm that you know we, we call these trustless systems so it is the base of trust between totally unknown counterparties in distributed borderless environments across countries, uh, and 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 also again, make, so it's you know on one part is what makes them secure and resilient. Mm-hmm. Okay? So uh, it, again, from the energy standpoint, it's it's not an even word. It's it's like you know uh, the, the the huge disparities in consensus. But the two main flavors are one which have dominated. One is the proof of work, and the other is proof of stake. So in, let's take a look at proof of work again. You know, this is the basis for public networks, basically like the Bit, Bitcoin and the current version of Ethereum. And uh, be, be, what it means is that in order to, uh, you know, to add any block on the blockchain, miners compete to solve difficult puzzles and they only get rewarded in cryptocurrency using their processing power to be the first solver. So we, we talk about an uneven world, you've got more power, you will, you know, for, for the kind of mathematics that's playing in these, uh, in, in crypto processing, you will be able to solve them first. So more power, more energy means you're making more. So this is, uh, you know, so that's, and, and because crypto gets generated and, and that's how it rewards, you know, this new crypto in Bitcoin is getting generated and transactions are getting verified. On the other hand, when we look at somewhat more recent proof of stake, which is now, you know, in Dash and Ethereum 2.0 is moving there and a lot of the other uh, blockchains as well. So there, now there is no competition. And uh, basically, so depending on what you stake, on a particular block, you get rewarded. So and now, it, saying, it, the more energy I burn, the more secure I am. No, no, no. The richer you are, the more you're willing to put up. Means more people, you know, you the block will get awarded to you. More people will, you, you know, you'll be validating more transactions. You're a validator, and you mm-hmm. will get rewarded in service fees. So there's no incentive mm-hmm. for mining, but there's an incentive for service. And the difference mm-hmm. in the two is in the energy you consume. So if you are mm-hmm. using proof of work, it's all about putting more computers. Mm-hmm. And you know, consuming the kind of energy growth we've seen. Uh, that's so that is, uh, Sandeep, sorry. So what I'm hearing is, is that there are different consensus mechanisms. There's proof of work that Bitcoin is using as proof of stake. That a couple of other uh, 
public blockchains are using. My understanding, and maybe Balmiki and Alex can jump in here, there are some pros and cons on the security side and maybe a different position as well. Um, I don't know who wants to, for, who wants to, wants to uh, jump in here first. Alex? Or in our free conversation, yeah, in our yeah, conversation. Either or, so, so the, you know, the, I think this is, this is again, you know, turning into this interesting conversation as to uh, from the greening of the blockchain to actually keeping it secure, right? So, so mm-hmm. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, my, my personal opinion on this is, is definitely very biased in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it's all based on the cryptography. And as cryptography, uh, you know, uh, solutions emerge and there are, uh, with the post quantum cryptography, there are different uh, states of security you will have uh, with respect to uh, the the uh, the solution. Right? Whether you're using a you know hashing or mm-hmm. using metric key cryptography or you're using asymmetric mm-hmm. cryptography, I think that those those will determine uh, what your state of security now versus what it will be in the in the future. So mm-hmm. hashing is not as vulnerable as of now. You know there is the there is going to be. Um, a, you know, when you compare that specifically to, uh, to mm-hmm. metric key cryptography, right? Um, and then the defense against, uh, I'd say, quantum computing is that a Bitcoin currently is a sharp with two statistic hashing algorithm, which is uh, considered partly quantum proof, it's not purely quantum proof, right? So it's about mm-hmm. that. Uh, I'd say security is a state of mind. <laughs> and specifically, so it's, it's also a matter of time when and how we are able to secure each of these, uh, 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 our ability mm-hmm. to provide the same set of security now versus uh, versus later. Um, currently, I, I think in, you know, the, the, in the two different uh, you know proof of work versus proof of state, in these two, uh, the the regenerative part of this is, is basically you know that you are able to recreate the whole chain or all over again and be able to verify and validate that. Uh, which will, I believe, is the is the kind of a common process and will continue to be on there. Uh, mm-hmm. When you move to uh, you know the pre versus post quantum computing, I think it will be essential for us to have the same level of efficiency, and it will not be the power generated versus the or the the work done or the effort done versus the actual processing or transaction done. The value based on that will determine the you know the efficiency of this. So I think security as a um, as you know, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience. These four will come to play uh, when determining what state or what, which which uh, one or the other um, you know uh, uh, blockchain technologies will be using, uh, whether in public or private use. So, what does this mean from a practical application? I know Mario, Alex, uh, Maria, yeah, Marta, sorry, you're all in that in that area today, and you have to think about which underlying technology, which consensus mechanism, how much energy is used in your project all the time. What are the pros and cons you're looking at in your way? I- yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's no perfect consensus mechanism. There's always trade-offs, and there's advantages and disadvantages to both the proof of stake as well as the proof of work. Um, you know, with regards to proof of work, um, I would say that it's basically energy dependent immutability. Um, and the advantage here is that you you really have to constantly innovate to find the cheapest and, and best sources of power, and you can't rely on being wealthy. In the case of proof of stake, the wealthier generally continually get yeah. wealthier. They stake their money, they get interest on that money, and their percent of the overall pie ownership stays the same. And so you don't get that sort of you know, decentralized um, effect that, that might be ideal. The other key point I would point out, um, mention is that when you're constantly searching for the cheapest power, oftentimes that cheapest power is actually uh, alternative energy. Um, is things like uh, uh, solar, is things like hydro. Um, and in the case of hydro, Many times the miners will directly contract with the hydro plants for excess power that would not have been otherwise utilized. Um, and so by sheer you know, capitalist motivations, you do look for those alternative energy, um, more green solutions because they're actually cheaper. Um, so you know, I think there's a number of different considerations, um, mm-hmm. but I, I think it, it both come with trade-offs. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I mean, w when looking at how to bring uh, how to bring blockchain to the masses and uh, um, really create adoption and bringing bringing you know uh, bringing it to the real world with tens, hundreds of millions of transactions. If you look at the status of how how technology is today, really the major the major base has been Ethereum for for many applications. Mm -hmm. um, Especially, well, especially today in centralized finance and so on. But we've seen how um, the Ethereum blockchain, while a bit more more energy efficient than Bitcoin, has created a sort of cap to what you can actually perform. And so, what people have done have tried to create layer two solutions to bring scalability to the Ethereum network. But really. If you're looking to to scale even further and bring this to the tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, as things stand today, you really have to look for alternative solutions, um, which have been built, and a lot of networks, virtually, you know, virtually all all of the newer networks or most of the newer networks uh, have transitioned to proof of stake, and now people uh, people are looking for something, you know, maybe hybrid or different. Um, but that's where the world is today. And definitely, as we've seen the space evolving significantly in the past four years, um, we'll continue to see that in the future. Marta, you guys just went live. So how how, how is Filecoin and the whole team thinking about it? Yeah, so Filecoin actually uses something called uh, proof of space time. Um, and so we wanted to take proof of stake and turn it into not just staking, but actually something that provides positive sort of social output. And so instead of just proof of stake, it's actually um, built on uh, data storage. So what you're actually proving is that you are uh, you are storing someone else's data, and that is the thing that allows you uh, to, to mine Filecoin. Uh, and so the miners are the ones storing data um, on the Filecoin network. And so it's a, it's a, a more sort of uh, a useful version, we think, of proof of stake. So it's like what uh, AWS or Microsoft would do in their data center when they store the data anyway. I see. So, so it has exactly. It's like it's where, like Airbnb for um, data storage. Like you can rent out uh, effectively hardware space on other people's uh, other people's hard. Okay, I'm not sure if I, there's so much space on my hard drive that I can participate, but uh, maybe some other people have some old servers lying around. <laughs> well, that's yeah. the idea, right? Same with, same with Bitcoin. Uh, it really mm -hmm. ends up being a little bit more institutional uh, with Bitcoin mining as well, right? Because mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have as much uh, uh, computing power lying around on your Fair enough. Uh, I want to uh, swing back to Alex because Alex, you mentioned something interesting. It's about alternative energies. It's the en so the energy that is used for Bitcoin is often in, uh, otherwise it might be even lost, like on a dam or even a solar factory or somewhere out in the middle of nowhere. And often those are placed in communities that are have less economic opportunities, at my understanding. So does this bring the monetization and economic opportunities to areas that otherwise uh, would not be participating in the global economy in a new way? I, I would say yes, I've seen it. Um, there are you know, instances in which you have, one of the biggest problems with alternative energies in general is that the population centers are often not where the energy is produced. Um, and I, I'm not an electrician, but there is some cost to building the infrastructure to get from the source of the energy to where the energy is needed. And there is some transmission, um, there is some electricity lost in the, in the actual transmission process. Um, and a lot of the areas where this energy is are in remote, um, underserved um, communities. They are not, you know, anywhere near New York City or San Francisco or London. I mean, they are in the most remote places that most people have never heard of. Um, and so there is some opportunity for kind of economic empowerment um, in communities that otherwise don't even make it on the radar. Um, and so I, I think there's also some potential economic benefit um, in, in underserved communities as well. I would support that, but with, with some, some sort of caution. I think, you know, for, for example, the, the power generation, as you, you write, Alex, and typically states, takes place away from, you know, mm -hmm. the human population where it actually mass mm -hmm. uses, whether it's industry or 
sometimes industry grows because our industrial zones are formed closer to power generation stations because mm -hmm. power is is a is a, is a uh, major part of the cost. Uh, but if you are talking about uh, power, uh, the traditional sources of power and tapping power from that, I think it is still uh, not only costly but also quite cumbersome to someone for someone to actually set up something like this and without the um, the environmental uh, issues that would have happened otherwise also, right? I mean, if you think about oil and gas companies with the pipelines and natural gas offshoot, which could be used for generating power locally uh, while they just burn out, right? I mean, it could be, but still, I think, you know, there's, a, there's quite a bit of environmental um, impact uh, just mm -hmm. letting that uh, or rerouting that to producing energy and setting uh, crypto uh, processing, I would, I would not suggest cryptocurrency, but in general, crypto processing um, mm -hmm. stations around that, right? I think it would it would probably be economically uh, viable, but environmentally still the sustainability has to be figured out. Now, when expanding that to, um, I mean, when you take the cost of bringing the electricity uh, over closer to, you know, urban areas or semi-urban areas, I think you know you, you gain some uh, economic scale of efficiency. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, the the scale at which it's needed to be tapped into, it, it, it's still you know there, it needs to be more consideration about um, how you can tap into the resources. So, so let me, if, I have, uh, if I may just jump in just for a minute, mm -hmm. a little bit different perspective. I, I think you know from a greening perspective, the mm -hmm. power and the greening or sustainability of crypto, which is only going to grow is actually gonna come from the newer protocols. So we've seen uh, proof of work, proof of stake, we've seen the changes. So in fact, all the new innovations are happening. If you take a look at our different protocols, proof of authority, proof of importance, and you know Avalanche now, and they are bringing the transactional overhead by one to two, in some cases, over three orders of magnitude. That means thousand times more. Now, here's the thing. Bitcoin is not going to change anytime soon. There's just, I mean, it's so entrenched. And it's also, it's like, you know, it's a big gorilla, like 80% or 90% is going through. But if we see some networks have started forking, Ethereum is large, Ethereum is forking to a new protocol. But all the new applications, and, and again, the smart contracts and, you know, from the blockchain, mm -hmm. they're all moving towards very stringent uh, proof of stake uh, protocols. And if we take just to close it off, Libra is a great example. It's not mm -hmm. there, but it will come, you know, one of these days. Mm -hmm. And it's again designed from the very get-go, taking stringency into account. So mm -hmm. I, I think, uh, and, and the reason is very simple. US and China are very lucky. They've got a huge amount of renewable dam water infrastructure, but the rest of the world just doesn't, right? And and, and, and so it's, you know, if, if IT or if mathematics and algorithms can change the equation, then that's the easiest way to get there, so. Yeah, but there are some interesting uh, projects in uh, in African and some African countries where they really leveraging uh, the, the the dams and and uh, building even sm uh, smaller farms to to drive things forward. I would love to. I think Martha um, and and Mario. I think you want you had some examples where it really is blockchain is a force for good, and I would love to really bring it to that to conversation see, so we can have. There is a cost on one side. There might be even an, there's definitely an energy cost. There might be an env environmental cost. But what are the benefits? What are the benefits uh, on society? And then I'm going back onto the IT side and the enterprise side after that as well. So maybe I can start over the, uh, start with you. Which one Martha? is you? Is that you, me? Oh, okay, sorry. Great. <laughs> you, I'm looking at you, Martha. Sorry, I'm still <laughs> <at> you. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think. That there's mm -hmm. such a there's such a huge um, advantage from a civil liberties perspective mm -hmm. of having the ability to, to transact online anonymously mm -hmm. or pseudonymously. Um, I always think back to the Hong Kong protests and you know seeing these pictures of folks in lines and at, at the train stations because they didn't want to use their subway cards because mm -hmm. it would place them at the scene of the protests. And so from a civil liberties perspective, um, I think there's a lot um, a lot to be said for financial. Mm -hmm. Privacy. Interesting. So, financial privacy opportunity is one thing. Mario, I think you're you're nodding. No. Yeah, no, abs absolutely. I I agree with that. And I would um, I would link it to also f financial inclusion, right? So, uh, especially in certain part of uh, of, of the world, uh, you know, the bank banking banking services are underserved to certain to certain mm -hmm. classes of population. Mm -hmm. 
but everybody has access to internet or or virtually everybody has access to internet um mm-hmm. so i mean for for example in in, in india um you know 4g has been introduced only around two and a half years ago and now people that were never connected to the internet that never mm-hmm. had uh, uh, the tv are now have 4g um, this has created a sort of le- leapfrog into the digital world um, where, where people, some people, especially in remote areas, may, may have access to the internet, uh, but uh, harder access to, to actually banking services. Yeah. And so with the use of, of tokenization uh, or with the use of cryptos, um, you may allow uh, you may allow these people to finally enter the financial the financial system. Obviously, the financial infrastructure in cryptocurrency in cryptocurrencies is still nascent, uh, but it's definitely there and it's coming to the real world. So it, it will definitely allow um, allow these people to 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 access banking, to connect with each other, to um, uh, you know being able to exchange value. But even more than that. Um, especially in the entertainment space, uh, what you've seen is, uh, you know, we're moving to a data economy, right? Uh, but right now, the data economy is kind of very dominated by, you know, the actually the, the players gathering the data and controlling it. So while you generate it with your digital footprint and your digital life, um, the data is is not really yours, or you are not the one getting the benefits of of, of how the data is used. So uh, this is also something interesting. So mm-hmm. that I, I also say I also look at it mm-hmm. from a financial inclusion perspective. So we can finally create uh, ways mm-hmm. through tokenization of mm-hmm. basically sh- sharing part of this value back, right? Mm-hmm. So. Where, yeah. where, where we're trying to go, for example, is create create algorithms to try mm-hmm. to give a value to all these mm-hmm. interactions. Mm-hmm. How much is a, a share piece of content worth? How much mm-hmm. is a like worth? Right? Mm-hmm. There's 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 today a value for for mm-hmm. for how much a brand is worth, yeah. how much an influencer is worth, and all of this. But really, mm-hmm. what is an influencer? An influencer is a sum of likes. Is a sum of people following, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So why not giving back part of this to 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 who is actually providing you the value? So the energy we are investing, yeah. So the energy we are investing really empowers a much broader section of the of of, your, of humanity. In, you talked about financial inclusion. I've been very passionate about the folks from Pundi X out of Indonesia. Um, they are now in dozens of countries providing financial access to people that didn't have access to the banking system before. So you're speaking directly, much uh, directly to me, of course, and to my heart here. Yeah. Uh, but I think the other point is even like tokenization of assets and to, uh, the ability to monetize individual data. I think those are really, really key points, I think, on an individual level. Having said that, the value of blockchain technology also in the end of, makes enterprises more efficient. Um, we were talking about we were talking about supply chains on one side, but even in the industrial side. And I think, Santi, uh, I think you talked about it briefly. I would love to look a little bit more. What are the benefits that are enterprises realizing by embracing the initial machine-to-machine communication, turning it into the Internet of Things, and now combining it with blockchain technology? I, I think it's it comes down to three things. One is, uh, you know, the visibility promotes efficiency. I know it sounds simple, but OPEX and, and uh, is managing our uh, investment decisions. So the fact that, uh, A, putting everything securely in a blockchain, giving people uh, permission or access to it carefully, uh, lets you make faster decisions, you know, again, more efficient operations. So that, that that's a one, one big, big particular part. Uh, the second aspect is also, I think, uh, where from a sustainability standpoint, it's really trying to say how much is enough. You know, mm-hmm. it's to say I want to put 20,000 cameras and if only six, 3% of them are really used. So I think what is happening is that as you have more information with more advances in, you know, algorithms and machine learning, you're now right-sizing investments. So, so you start carefully and, and, and on one hand, putting the right sensors in the right place, monitoring the right phenomena, but also reusing that information. So now I don't need to put 10 cameras, one for safety, one for counting, one for inspection, one for this, one for that, right? To try to take multiple value and, and also for maintenance, trying it to maintenance. So, so to put it together, it's better operations, more safety, more reuse, 
better investment, mm-hmm. return on, uh, you know, and, and again, more operational efficiency. And, and mm-hmm. hopefully all of that together drives, starts getting uh, uh, in a more sustainable way. Mm-hmm. So I mean, there, are, there are some famous examples from uh, British Petrol and Singapore Airlines yes. uh, uh, that, that have gone through the press over the last months. Is there any in your areas, and I'm saying you know in the broader area, industrial applications that really thought uh, would be interesting for the broader community to learn about that they might not have heard it, about? It, 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 so, so just the three of them. I, I think one, uh, so, sorry, I don't know if it directed, but aerospace parts, you know, so, because now we, again, in automobile and aerospace, and, and even pharmaceuticals are the big issues of recalls, right? Something goes wrong. Now you got to do these recalls. So putting things in a secure blockchain, completely putting the chain of custody, who touched when, who inspected it. So mm-hmm. I, I think it's, it's managing a, what I call a better product quality. So in pharmaceuticals, yeah, I think especially, yeah, especially with the innovative, with the immunization now in COVID, it, I think it, we're and I'm going to get to it. And in that. fact, you know, the, mm-hmm. uh, the vaccine passports, the entire supply chain distribution mm-hmm. of vaccines, for, for many, many countries and many communities is all going to be in blockchain. May not be mm-hmm. done by the government. There are many private foundations setting in and, 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 and mm-hmm. working. So I, I think, uh, again, as far as health and pharmaceuticals goes, we, we will very soon be in blockchains. Aerospace is already getting there for most large programs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, automobiles, uh, the, the, the supply chain systems for, you know. So the, the, those okay. are big, big and then we can, of course, there's always offsetting. I think, Alex, you talked about silo and uh, uh, carbon negative funding. Tell us a little bit more about what's possible on that side. I know we've planned yeah. trees for taking airline tickets, which, by the way, nobody's flying anymore. But uh, what's happening in the blockchain space there? Absolutely. I mean, that we're um, on Cello. We have actually created a negative uh, carbon negative blockchain. So better than carbon neutral. Um, And we do that by buying carbon credits with block rewards each and every block. So there's a sustainability fund that was voted for by the community on chain that goes to buying carbon credits and planting trees. Um, So, you know, there's there's a future um, in which the net impact of of blockchains uh, driven by communities um, on chain voting on chain um, can actually have a, a net positive impact on the environment. Um, and I think the, the Cello blockchain is one example of that. Mm-hmm. And I would emphasize again that this is actually completely driven by a decentralized community of people who expressed the concern um, on the environmental impact um, and then chose to have some of the rewards go towards that um, positive sustainable impact. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think the the, the probably the, uh, okay. the the main one of the issues that I was uh, kind of so no, uh, so I, I I don't know if the if the uh, the voice stopped for a little bit. Look, I might have a slight like network fight. problem. Martha, can you All right, can you again. add to that? Sure. Sure, um, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think that from like a perspective of uh, uh, from a perspective of carbon carbon neutral. Um, oh no, we've lost Mark. Oh, you're back. Okay, great. Sorry, sorry, um, sorry. I, I don't know if I was gone. Or everybody else was gone. But, Mark's uh, uh, for uh, high powered. Uh, <laughs> I was I was trying. So <laughs> while Alex was finishing, I was saying, okay, Martha. Um, what are the examples on the, on, on the other side, you know, from California? Well, Filecon is not only uh, California, it's, of course, it's a distributed and decentralized community. Um, how are you thinking about uh, the, the, the carbon offsetting as one option? Yeah, I mean, look, data storage is, is, a, huge use of, uh, is a huge use of computing power uh, worldwide. Oh no. Well, I will continue and maybe we'll get Mark back. <laughs> Poor Mark. Um, but I will continue. So, so I, you know, I, data storage is a huge use of, uh, unfortunately, a, a huge use of, of computing power worldwide. And as a result, you end up having uh, quite a lot of energy usage. Um, and I, I think that the idea of doing it um, via Filecoin 
is is something that you know it is is not carbon it carbon negative <laughs> unfortunately we're not cello um but is is ideally not worse than the existing state Well, Mickey, you were going to say something uh, before we yeah. had all the glitches. Uh, I was going to back up a little bit, you know, and, and talk about uh, so, the the two aspects that we we mentioned. Uh, one about uh, privacy. I think you know, uh, with with respect to the baseline protocol that uh, EY recently, in partnership with uh, Consensus and Microsoft, went together. Uh, when you talk about the industrial usage, and I think there's also the connection IT might be failing. To, the IT usage is basically making sure that there is a baseline for all the financial systems that's out there, right? That probably backs into the industrial usage that you mentioned about supply chain, so that we have third-party uh, supply chain and the entire risk, uh, the financial accounting, and also the assurance of the supply uh, of the parts and, and different even, even for software bill of materials that we are talking about. Know, in fact, uh, this Tuesday I have this discussion with the. Uh, with Alan Friedman on, on software bill of materials. So I, I think there is an essential part uh, of this application where we are able to uh, assure the movement of data, parts, and people, right, across uh, with, with, with due care for privacy, um, right? I think privacy by design is, is, is being built into this right now as it was not earlier in the traditional IT systems. Okay. okay. Well, we had one so uh, we had one question from the audience. Um, I think uh, Melissa from Singapore was asking uh, both proof of work and proof of stake reward both with the resources. So computing power, data center, the money to actually build these resources. Um, I know we touched briefly already uh, on on uh, some of the potential empowerments in communities, but is that fair to say? Or chain technology can really add value to the broad masses. I'll just take a quick cut at it. I, I think the newer protocols are designed which are not data center heavy. You know, you need few uh, validators. In fact, uh, what, uh, but uh, there's a price to be paid for it. I, and I take Libra as a great example. So let's see how they are, are doing it, right? So now you want to have a large, actually a group of organizations build an encrypted ledger and then let manage all the transactions, right? But by doing it, it takes down by three to four orders of magnitude your power, your hardware, your resources for everybody else. Okay, so you are giving up some decentralization in in order to get uh, you know to be resource light. And then let's take a look at consensus. There's a new protocol consensus, which is proof of stake, does not run within virtual machines, and it runs really on few validators. But its concept is let's penalize people who do not follow the rules, right? So, so I, I, th I think that uh, it, it, the world has woken up to uh, both, uh, you know, a, 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 in, a not just the energy footprint, but also the rich getting richer, being resource heavy, and that, that you know, that it will kind of cut into the basic premise of the benefit itself. So we are looking now at a protocol where somebody with like as little as a laptop or even a phone that can run a virtual machine would be able to participate and in fact even run validators with something that light. So yeah. uh, it's, it's again, you know, technology created the problem and technology is the solution. And I, I think what I want to go back to what, uh, Mar what uh, Martha was saying, that it, it, it is the next phase is really going to be how to monetize the data for everybody, you know, how to get a broader participation, that how can I actually, what you were saying, sort of own your own data so that people, So I, I think we have we have to we have to just continue on with the with three minutes left here, right? Uh, there's some someone talking. I, I don't know if that's a comment or an observation. Uh, but but with with your with your comment on this specifically, Sandeep, I think uh, you know as the proof of stake gets and the more val the role of validator becomes more and more, uh, the, I would say reinforced on especially in the enterprise private uh, computation on public blockchain. I think there will be. Uh, there will be more distribution. I, I, I think as the, this will be an opportunity to actually re-explore what we do from the enterprise side, so that more people have act, have act, have role rather than with proof of work. More, you know, the more energy you you spend, the more you know you are rewarded accordingly. I think that's already seen the change with Ethereum moving to proof of stake and and everything else probably going to go the same way with validators being fully you know 
and with 5G and then the um, uh, you know peer to peer computing. I mean that that's another uh, you are facilitating you know the, making sure the smaller uh, players are also able to gain or have access to this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a valid point, though, that, that um, Melissa, you bring up is that, you know, that it really is a case where the big corporations, the big industrials are, you know, managing most of the hash power um, in the case of Bitcoin. Um, and in the case of, of proof of stake, there's now staking as a service. And um, with other networks, um, you see exchanges actually completely dominate um, the, the consensus. So... Basically, a lot of people store their, their, for example, EOS on an exchange, um, and then the exchange can uh, vote on their behalf. Um, and so you do have this concentration of power um, that is concerning and that is contrary to kind of the ethos of where crypto began. Um, what I would say, though, is that there is, um, there, there is hope. Um, there's, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, most has already been mined. Um, and so there is already relatively significant decentralization. And for somebody who's based in Venezuela or Zimbabwe, where there's hyperinflation, um, having just a little bit of Bitcoin is still much, much better than the, the alternative. Um, and I think in, in the case of, of Ethereum, you know, the, the barrier to entry to running your own node um, is 32 Ethereum, which is about $12,000. It's not a small amount. Um, but it does let you to be profitable in taking part in the network um, without a huge amount of money. Yeah, it is getting democratized. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, there's hope. There's hope. Any word from you? That you can actually do it and, and make people and take people along with you. Right. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I think we're at the end of time. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're, we're unfortunately we're at the end of time. Um, I appreciate everybody's contribution. I apologize for Comcast and the technology challenges on my end here. Um, but um, I hope and I think uh, we really got a couple of steps forward and getting a joint understanding of what is possible with blockchain technology and what if it's worth it um, to invest our energy into empowering more billions more of the world through the technology and uh, the efficiency that it brings. I appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Alex, Mario, Sandy, Pitaki, and Ma uh, Marta. Thank you, really, really appreciate your contributions and your patience. This is so fun. Thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Bye. 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 Bye, guys.